Hi guys, it's Mark Zickrey, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickrey of Space Command and many other things. And today I'm wearing my paleontological shirt with the bones and the pterodactyl and all of that stuff. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Harlan Ellison was a wonderful friend and mentor, wonderful writer. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because the 50s into the 60s was a period where science fiction writers were starting to write some of the TV shows and movies. And the, the real first um, version of that ever was H.G. Wells uh, when he wrote Things to Come, which was released in 1936. And, um, and then into the 50s, we got Heinlein writing Destination, Destination Moon. We got um, Arthur C. Clarke collaborating with Stanley Kubrick on 2001 A Space Odyssey, Gene Roddenberry and Rod Serling, and um, uh, Joseph Stefano and the other writers on Twilight Zone, Star Trek, Outer Limits brought in a lot of science fiction writers, uh, Ray Bradbury, Theodore Sturgeon, uh, on and on, you know, uh, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont. And, um, and as a result, you were getting science fiction film and TV shows that were of a greater intellect and a greater ambition than ever before. And Harlan saw this great possibility, and he'd been writing uh, science, writing and publishing science fiction since the 50s uh, with increasing success. And in 1962, he came to L.A. to make his mark as a film and TV writer. And by the early 70s, he uh, was looking to create and run his own show. Uh, he had written City on the Edge of Forever for Star Trek. He'd written Soldier and Demon with a Glass Hand for Outer Limits. Uh, he was not pleased with what was done on City on the Edge of Forever. It was rewritten by many people. I think and it created something quite wonderful, but Harlan was very embittered about that. So he was approached to develop a series that was going to be shot in Canada, but air in America and um, in the United States. And it was uh, called The Star Lost. And interestingly enough, uh, Ben Bovo, who was a science advisor on it, wrote a novel that was sort of a satire of what happened on it called The Star Crossed. And you can find that, and Harlan is actually in the illustration on the cover. But when I was a student at UCLA, in the uh, early 70s, uh, Harlan taught a great class called Ten Tuesdays Down a Rabbit Hole, and I was a painting, sculpture, and graphic arts major back in 1973. So we're talking a long time ago, and uh, Harlan was a young Turk, and he talks about the development of this idea and how it went terribly, terribly awry. Now, um, there's a little piece missing from it, because at one point the tape broke, and uh, I had to stitch it back together, and I lost a couple minutes, and so that piece is where Harlan's talking about the Writers Guild went on strike and Harlan, working in Canada, was trying to determine whether or not he could write and not violate the, the rules of his own union. And they were trying to figure that out, and for a time Harlan was not writing the pilot script and they desperately needed the pilot script, so they hired a scab writer, someone who would go against the strike and write a script. And Harlan sought this writer out and said, you must not turn this in, you must not um, break the strike. And the writer said he would do that, he would do that. I think Harlan even offered to pay him uh, if he didn't um, turn it in. And, but then somehow the script did get uh, submitted, did get turned in, did get into the pipeline. So then Harlan, uh, they judged that Harlan could write uh, for a Canadian show and Harlan jumped back in and wrote his own pilot script. And so the scab version uh, was never used, was not used. It was, I think, a script in a Bible. And so, uh, so basically, uh, Harlan's notion for the Star Lost was that it took place on what was called a generation ship. And this would be a ship going from Earth to Proxima Centauri and because it was a slower than light drive, because according to Einstein, you can't go faster than light, uh, it would take hundreds of years to get there. And, um, and Harlan posited an Amish community uh, not knowing they were in a starship and a, and a young man who discovers what's really going on because there's been a breakdown in the society and the fact that they're on a spaceship has been lost down the generations. And he has to uh, bring everyone to awareness of this. Now this is not the first time this story was done. The idea of a generation ship, a ship that would take many generations to reach its, its destination, hundreds of years, was, was first uh, uh, proposed by scientists uh, in the early 20th century, uh, among them two rocket scientists, an American named Robert Goddard and a, a Russian named Tsiolkovsky. And both of them were very, very influential in, uh, in starting the American and the Russian space programs in terms of th their theoretical bases and their experiments with rockets. And, uh, and then the first, and then it got into, because, because all the science fiction writers were reading science books, and many of them were scientists, it got into the science fiction literature. And the first major uh, exploration of this in fiction was Robert A. Heinlein, who wrote a, a novella called Universe. And it was actually published, I'll show you, 
this cover, which is absolutely great. It was published in uh, 1939 initially, and the idea of Universe was that it's a generation ship, people have forgotten uh, that it's a spaceship, and they think it's just the universe, and if you go up to the higher levels, radiation gets in, and the people who live up there are uh, mutated by the radiation, so you have a two-headed character, and that's why this guy's got two heads in the background. So this is a collector's item, of course, and um, Heinlein then expanded the, uh, the novella into a novel called Orphans in the Sky that came out sometimes la sometime later. Again, you can find this on, on, uh, on Amazon and on eBay and so forth, ABE books. But, um, but, but that sort of started the ball rolling in earnest, and most major science fiction writers wrote their version of the, um, of the, of the generation ship novel. And uh, Brian Aldiss wrote one called Starship, and uh, Alexei Panshin wrote one called uh, Rite of Passage. Kim Stanley Robinson in more recent years wrote Aurora. Uh, Harry Harrison wrote Captive Universe. So, so this was all in, this, in the general stew. Now, now one thing about science fiction is that there were tropes in science fiction, the time travel story, the generation ship story, the after the bomb story, and all of this, and, and the colonization of space uh, story. And, uh, and all of these were uh, grist for the mill, and because all of these writers were writing for a penny a word, five cents a word, ten cents a word on a good day, uh, they, there was a fraternal uh, feeling amongst them, so no one felt ripped off if someone would write a generation ship story and then someone would write their own version of that, leaping off from it and going in a different direction. And it was, because uh, they were all going to the World Science Fiction Conventions, they all knew each other, and no one was getting rich off any of this uh, through the through the 1950s into the 60s. So, um, so Harlan, in the, in the early 70s, comes up with um, The Star Lost, and he wrote his pilot script, which was called Phoenix Without Ashes. I believe it won the Writers Guild Award, uh, and, um, and then it was, of course, wrecked, changed, screwed up, uh, and shot. And so what we're going to hear in a moment or two is the audio of Hour 25, where Harlan talks uh, it's a wonderful monologue, basically, where Harlan tells the story of how he came up with the idea and how it got ruined, and, and how he ultimately put his pseudonym, Cordwainer Bird, on that show. And Cordwainer, the first, the Cordwainer part was a, a, a tip of the hat to Cordwainer Smith, one of the great science fiction writers, and the bird was Harlan flipping the bird or giving the bird to, uh, to these producers. So, um, but, but ultimately, Harlan's draft, that script, was published in this anthology, Faster Than Light. It, I think it's probably been published elsewhere, too. You can, you can track it down. But, um, but Harlan had, the, had concept illustrations done by Tim Kirk, who was a, a, a very fun artist who was sort of, I think he started in the fan circles and then became a pro artist, but, uh, but it, it's Harlan's entire script and then it has um, the, the illustrations by Tim Kirk in it. So it's, it's well worth seeking out. Again, it's Faster Than Light. Uh, it's an anthology edited by Jack Dan and George Zabrowski. So, uh, so you can certainly find it if you, uh, if you look for it. So, um, so anyway, so that's sort of the basics, but this, uh, but this recording of Harlan is from 1973. It's one of my prized possessions, and you can really hear Harlan at the height of his powers. He's brilliant. He's very, very temperamental. He's um, uh, a total package. And, uh, the, and, and, you know, it's funny because some writers, they give their best in their work, and then when you meet them, they're quiet or they're shy or maybe they're socially awkward. Many writers are turned inward, but some writers are wonderful to meet because they are consistent with their work. Uh, Char certainly Charles Dickens was one of those, and Mark Twain, and in recent years, of course, Ray Bradbury and Harlan. And uh, so, um, and all of us who, who, who interact with our, our audience uh, aspire to that. We want to be entertaining when people talk to us and meet us and hear us tell stories. So, um, so without further ado, those are the dogs in the background, not dinosaurs. Here's Harlan Ellison in all of his glory. Uh, we lost him at age 84, but we can revisit him in film and TV and books and, uh, and in recordings of, of Harlan talking and, and saying his mind. So that's it. We'll talk to you next time. I hope you enjoy this. You were invited down here, sir, to talk about a project that uh, you started out being very enthused about, what, a year ago? Uh, no, not quite a year. It was, uh, well, maybe, I guess it is, yeah, just about a year ago, February, February of uh, this year. And uh, now, all of a sudden, you are less than happy with it. And that is, a, that is the show that's on NBC Saturday nights at 7 called The Star Lost. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there was, surely by coincidence, I'm sure, in today's trades... I heard about that. Did you have a there copy? There was an ad. I had that, and I gave it to uh, the manager, Will Lewis. That ad is utter bullshit. 
what it said was that uh, it got you know reasonably respectable ratings in L.A. Uh, and in New York, except for one week when it wasn't on. But the thing that interested me was the second episode of The Star Lost, the one that you wrote. No, no, I only wrote the first one. I thought you wrote the second. No, I wrote one episode, the first, and, and that was badly butchered. And I was going to say that I like the second episode better than anything else I've seen. Well, but, you, uh, you. The, the ratings disagreed with me. That was the lowest rated one of the four. Well, the, the, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. We have, what, a, uh, something less than an hour for us to wrap? Uh, something more than an hour. Okay, let me, let me tell you something. I tried... I, I've been... How the hell? I, I don't even know where to begin. It is. It is. It's like going at a. It's like going at a at a tapestry. Where Where do you begin? It's. It's. It is the most complex, ugly situation I, I've ever been involved in. Why don't we start at the top and just kind of work through it chronologically and just see how how a, how a concept gets oh, translated or mistranslated? Well, I'll try. I but I have to. I have to make a couple of disclaimers at the outset. One. I have been warned by the attorneys at 20th Century Fox that if I persist in running my mouth, they're going to sue me. Uh, I have not been stingy in my bad rapping of this series, and uh, particularly in Canada where it's being shot, and the columnists there have picked up on it, and it's got an enormous, enormous play. I did a, an interview over the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, and uh, they are furious. They're absolutely furious about it. And uh, they, uh, they keep screaming at me and telling me that uh, they're going to sue. And uh, I, I, I really would welcome such a thing because I think for once and all, someone ought to take into court the butchers and Visigoths and hold them up for close scrutiny because these people are lower than swine. They're the worst. So uh, if, I, if at some points I say, oh, well, I better not talk about that, it's because I, I can't prove it. It may be so, but I can't prove it. I'll start at the, uh, at the, at the get-go, if you want. Uh, begins, I'm going to need a glass of water somewhere along in the middle of this, if you can bring me one, or a Coke, or any bloody... Sure. Thing. I tried telling this one. I just came back from a college lecture tour, and I, I one, and everybody asked me about it, and I, and I said, look, I'd rather not talk about it. It is painful to me in my gut, and it really is. Uh, but one evening at, uh, I guess it was Bowling Green, Ohio, I decided I would tell it, and it took two hours to tell the goddamn story. So I'll try and encapsulate it for you. It began in February of this year, 73. My agent said, go over to 20th Century Fox and see a fellow named Bob Klein. That's K-L-I-N-E, Robert Klein. I said, what, uh, what's, his, uh, what's his scam? He said, well, he's putting together a group of miniseries for the BBC in collaboration with 20th Century Fox. There'll be eight or nine episodes and like a, a novel for television. And I immediately thought of The Prisoner. And I thought, my God, what a tremendous way to go, where you could tell a story in eight or nine episodes and do it progressively and build the characters and come out with something really interesting. And, he, and Marty said, well, uh, this client wants to do, uh, among the series, one of them he wants to do is a science fiction series. I said, fine. So I went over to see Klein at 20th. Klein is a very smooth, slick operator. He is, uh, <laughs> he is, he is a master of the Spiro Agnew no-speak. He, uh, you will ask him a question directly, and he'll say, well, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I'll get back to you on that. I walked in, and we began talking. And it became very apparent to me, after a few minutes, that while he was trying to butter me up with what a terrific human being I was, what a credit to my race, what great credits I had, how he knew about all my awards, you know, all that bullshit, that what he really wanted was, and he, and he called it this, the fugitive in space. And I said, well, that's, uh, that's a dumb idea. I said, the fugitive has been done and redone in three or four different ways. And is the food here? Oh, that's the Coke. Thank you. That's water. Oh, boy. Excuse me a moment, folks. I will drink. What the hell was that? <laughs> that was a tape being wound fast forward or in reverse. That was your friendly here. engineer being incompetent. Sorry. Oh, Sorry about that. really are a brain damage case. Anyhow, I... um... <laughs> I love you too. We, uh, we talked about this fugitive in space thing, and I said that's a really dumb idea. It's a it's a, a very sterile idea. I said, how about this? And I popped at him an idea for a series that I had put together called Man Without Time, which was supposed to have gone on NBC, but that got messed up and didn't go. He thought it was too complex. Then I said, well, there are a couple of other ideas I've got, and he said, well, what are they? And I laid them on him. One of which was the idea of the enclosed universe. It's a very simple idea. It's uh, uh, the last remnants of the dead Earth have been put on a ship uh, a thousand miles long and have been sent out to the far stars. An accident has taken place a hundred years after they take off. 
they have been locked in the ship. They do not know where they came from, where they are going. They do not, in fact, even know that they're on a spaceship. They don't know that they're moving through, through the universe. They think that the world uh, has metal walls. Now, it's not, uh, it's not a new idea. It's an old idea. It was uh, the, the, the most popular version of it is Robert Heinlein's story, Universe, which appear, uh, he in, in included in his book, Orphans of the Skies. But it was done long before Heinlein. It was done by Don Wilcox. It was done back in 1920... No, 1936. Heinlein did uh, Universe in 39, and the story was written in 36 by other people. Um, most people think that Heinlein originated it. That is not the case, but he popularized it. Since then, it's been done as Rite of Passage by Alex Panshin. It was done as... Uh, um, uh, what the hell's the name of it? Uh, Something Universe by uh, Harry Harrison. I can't remember it. Uh, there's, there's five or six major versions of this story. Well, he liked the idea. He thought it was good. And he said, why don't you go home and write that down and uh, so I can show it to the BBC. And I said, well, I said, the Writers Guild does not permit me, which he knew very well indeed, does not permit me to write on speculation. I am not allowed to set anything down on paper. If you wish to pay me, I will set down a presentation, which you can then market uh, if you want to pay me some holding money. Uh, we can do that. He said, no, no, we can't do that. There's no money yet, blah, blah, blah. He gave me a fast ramadula. I said, well, then uh, I'm just going to have to pass. And I started to walk. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. And he opened his desk drawer and reached in, and this was the first indication of what sort of a human being Mr. Klein was, also what sort of a businessman. Tape recorder, cassette tape recorder. And he said, why don't you talk it onto this cassette, just like you just did to me? Wait, folks, my food has arrived. We haven't eaten, and I want you to know that the incredible, gorgeous Nori Wright, who is here with me tonight, and I are now about to have grilled cheese sandwiches, very hot, very melted. <laughs> sir, dinner is served. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, did you bring salt for the French fries? Yes, sir. Salt and ketchup. Oh, you marvelous human being. And, uh, you know, this is KPFK, Radio uh, Verite. Oh, yes, the <laughs> Yes. Uh, which one? Is, which one would you like, my dear? Oh, that's mine with the two. On. Yes. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. You would not believe that there's a livery chauffeur and butler. Thank you. Thank you. A monocle hanging on his left back. One orange. One orange. Yes, that's what it is. A young woman. Bunch of cottage cheese. Oh, that's mine too. Yes, the cottage cheese there. Mm. Mm. The milk is mine. Yes. Thank you. And a whole bunch of this. Oh, a whole bunch of that. Oh, good lord. <gasps> Of this? No, that's this. Uh, this. I think this. Uh, I love you, sir. Uh, well, somebody. <laughs> On top. Yes. <laughs> Moving right back to the story. Uh, I'll take a word. He said, go ahead and read this. And I, now, now, there are very strict regulations against speculative writing in the Writers Guild. I mean, you just are not allowed to do it. It's a very bad thing indeed. And I, uh, I thought about it, and I thought, is this, is this speculative talking or what? You know, to take. I mean, I'd never seen anything. You see, the trouble with laws is they never keep up with technology, and the writers guild had never confronted this kind of thing before. <laughs> so, I think, hmm, by the way, if my voice gets a little crummy while I'm talking, it's because I'm eating. Anyhow, um, yeah. So that is the worst grilled cheese oh sandwich. God, Harlan, that's disgusting. Life. Stay away from Cindy's. You're poisoned. <laughs> you have a napkin. Mm -hmm. um, listen, thank you for... It's not your fault. You brought the food. I'm delighted. Terrific. Okay, moving right along. Uh, um, so, I took the tape recorder in the other room and tried to record it. Of course, his machine didn't work properly. So, I took his cassette and I went home. And uh, uh, I recorded it there. Now, I get into shticks. I love doing bits. So, when I start to tell it, as I just told it to you, with a little more detail... Um, I put on the Sprague Zarathustra behind me, you know, the 2001 movie. Boom, boom, boom. The Star Logs by Har You know, I did a whole big production. It was really ugly and fantastic. Now, I take it back to him, and I say to him, here is the cassette. You may use it to sell BBC, but you may not transcribe it. If you transcribe it, that will then make it speculative writing, and I will not, I will not have that. He says, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Okay. I don't hear another word from him till sometime late in April, March, April, something like that. And I keep calling my agent. I say, what's happening? What's happening with this clown? He hasn't paid me a dime. My agent says, hang in there, hang in there. He, he's going to try and sell to the BBC. What I did not know, <clears throat> what I did not know was that the BBC had turned it down, along with a number of other ideas of his. They had accepted a couple, but they had turned that one down. They thought it was too expensive to do. By this time, Doug Trumbull had been brought in on the project. He and I were working at another project at Screen Gems on a, on a sorcery series. Um, 
and uh, we wanted to use his new magic ham technique, okay, for the matting process. So Doug Trummel was brought in on the project with his partner, Jerry Zeitman. Remember all these names, folks. Remember all these names. They figure prominently. Um, I don't hear a word. Finally, I get very annoyed with my agent. I say, okay, find out what the hell's happening. So he calls him up, and he says, well, we've sold it. I said, fantastic. Now, part of the deal was he had promised me that I would go to London. I would be this, you know, I would be the story editor. I would write some of the scripts and blah, 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 blah. Terrific production would be shot at the Lou Grade Studios, which are great studios. And I figure, hot damn, I'm going to London, man. Go up to his office when I hear it sold, and he says, yes, sir, we've sold it, and we're going to shoot it in Toronto. <laughs> I said, what? He said, Toronto. I said, how can we shoot a BBC show in Toronto? He says, not BBC. It's going to be done on the Canadian television network, the CTV. I said, wait a minute, you told me, you told me, England. He says, no, no, it's Canada. He didn't ask me. He, you understand, he had not paid me a dime. He did not own the idea, had no right to it, had already sold it, had already marketed it, and had not paid me a dime, okay? So I said, well, how did he get up in Canada? Well, we're going to do it in Canada, ba -ba 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 -ba. great facilities up there, you're going to love it, you're going to love it, and he goes on and on and on and on. And I said, well, uh, Toronto is not London. Don't worry, says he, I'll get you to London. I said, terrific, I'll get to London. So, we move on a pace. Um, my mind grows dim as I think back on what the sequence was, but, but what the sequence was was that he had, what he had then done was transcribed the tape, which he had promised me he would not. That was his first breach with me. He had, he had transcribed it and he had marketed it as a written presentation, which he had no right to do. Uh, when I found that out, I went sky high. But he says, well, we had to give him the words, blah, blah, blah. I said, how could you give them that? I said, it was absolutely illiterate. It was just me rapping, for God's sakes. It was a 12-minute tape of me rapping. I said, there was, you know, you can't, you can't sell an idea like that. Oh, they loved it. They loved it. I said, well, how could they love it? It didn't make any sense. I said, it made enough sense for them. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now it's going to be Canada, and I'm not happy about that. But I had written the series for Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov on Star Trek. He's a very close friend of mine. He's a brilliant, brilliant actor. Marvelous, marvelous guy. He's also a writer. He's written a number of scripts, and he's really, really fantastic. And I wanted Walter to play the part of Devon. Except at that time, I did not have the name Devon. I used a name, I don't know, Rick or something like that. It was because, you know, I was, when I rapped, I just did it off the top of my head. So, um... He then tells me that they're going to sell it on NBC to all of the NBC O and O stations. O and O means owned and operated. That's the independent NBC stations, right? In the seven o'clock time slot that the FCC had given back to the studios, I said, "Well, doesn't that make it kind of a? Won't it be a kind of a juvenile series if it's at seven o'clock?" I mean, I know how the network thinking goes on that. He said, "No, no, we can do bold, forthright adult dramas." I said, "Okay, that sounds fair to me." Now, the guys from the Meet You. They had bought the series on the strength of my name and Doug Trumbull's name, right? So they wanted to meet me. So we are now, I'm in company with Klein this one evening. We're going to meet them at his apartment in Malibu. And we are in company with a man named Preston Fisher. F-I-S-C-H is a toady. T-O-A-D-Y. Toady. A slug-like creature who leaves a moist trail when he walks. Huh? Now, we are going up in the elevator. See, Preston Fisher is Klein's opposite number with 20th Century Fox in New York. He's the head of tape programming in New York. Klein is the head of tape production here on the coast. Klein is sort of the, uh, and Fisher is sort of his trilby. Uh, very flat-chested trilby. Anyhow, we are going up in this elevator, one of those glass elevators on the outside of a building, when they say to me, thank you, Noy, she just put a french fry in my mouth. Um, they say to me, Guess who we got for the lead? Albert Schweitzer, says I, <laughs> indulging my gay and clever wit. No, say they, we got care delay. I hit the emergency stop on the elevator button. The elevator <laughs> cranked to a halt, and I said, you got who? You got what? Yes, we have care delay. We saw him in Butterflies Are Free in London, and he was terrific. I said, the part of Devon is written for a a peasant, someone who can sit on the earth with the dirt in his hands and cry if the need be. Kier Delay looks like he's been wrapped in saran wrap since the day he was born. What are you doing to me with, 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 thank you for the change. From, from five dollars, I get that 23 cents? Jesus, what did you do, go to Peru to buy it? Anyhow, um, never look a gift horse, right? Um, uh, well, I you said, found out what it is. 
<laughs> yeah. Llama. I said, I don't want cure delay. Well, we need cure delay, blah, 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 blah. I don't want cure delay. They, now we're parked in this elevator, halfway up the side of a building, and they're petrified of fear. I'm going to throw them right out a glass window, right? Because <laughs> I'm running amok inside this elevator, and foaming and th terrible things. And they say, um, we need cure delay because uh, we've got to sell the whole package. And he's a big science fiction actor. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, he was in 2001, so he must be a big science fiction actor. By their thinking, the incredible tunnel vision of Hollywood producers, there are only two actors who are science fiction actors. One of them is Cure Delay, the other one is Charlton Heston. <laughs> right? Of course. What about Walter so Pigeon? Green, he was in Planet of the Apes. He must be a science fiction actor. What about Walter Pigeon? Asked John Henry. What about Walter Pigeon? Or Gary Lockwood? No, Gary, see, Gar Gary Lockwood has no charisma. Gary Lockwood, Gary Lockwood gets vicious. Cure Delay is very soft and gentle. He's malleable. He, he mumbles into his mustache a lot. Anyhow, so they uh, they say we don't don't fuck this up. We gotta have cure delay. Blah blah blah. The network wants him. So I I assume the network wants him, and I say okay. Now this is something else. You must understand that writers seldom get to talk to the network people. There's always some schlepper in between us, like Bob Klein or Preston Fisher. That's F I S C. Well, anyhow, um, who do all of the talking? And they interpret everything, and they interpret it to their own ends, you dig? What I did not know was that Preston Fisher and Cure Delay were very close friends. Dum, da dum, dum. <laughs> Got that? Okay. Now we get up into the apartment. Doug Trumbull shows up with Jerry Zeitman. You remember them. And a happy dancing duo. Um, and after a little while, in come these very tall, elderly gentlemen from Toledo, Ohio, or Dayton, or something like that, from some NBC station, wearing very sincere gray suits, earnest ties, and honest white shirts. They sit down, and I immediately begin to hit it off with one of the guys. He's kind of cool, and we kind of like each other, and, he, and he, he's, he's grooving on me, and I'm grooving on him, and we're talking about what a cesspool Dayton is and things like that. <laughs> and um, as I've often said, if they were going to give an enema to the United States, they would put in the tube at Dayton. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so... Um, <laughs> We're talking along, and he's, he's happy with me, and he thinks, he thinks I'm going to do a good job, and I'm telling him what the series is going to be and how nice it's going to be and all like that. And then he says, um, how do you feel about Cure Delay? There is a hushed, awesome silence in Bob Klein's Malibu apartment. And Bob Klein turns several shades of ochre, white on white face, and uh, I say to this gentleman, I say, uh, whose name I cannot remember right now, he's a very nice man, I said, do you want... A politic answer or an honest answer? He says, I want an honest answer. They always are going to say honest answer, right? I mean, they're used to being lied to, but they will always say, I want an honest answer. So I said, frankly, I think Kira DeLay sucks. Now, uh, Bob Klein gropes for the digitalis. Preston Fisher melted into a soft puddle of jelly. Oozed under the little nut cups on the table. And um, he, says, uh, he says, why do you think that? So I told him. He says, yes, I agree with you. I think he's much too... Uh, we compared notes, and it seems that Cure Delay had only played psychotics in movies, you know, who, what happened to Bunny Lake, or Bunny Lake is Missing, whatever it was, uh, David and Lisa, um, in Butterflies Are Free, he was blind, right? And in 2001, he had about as much character and charisma as, say, a bowl of Rice Krispies, right? Old Rice Krispies. Uh, so he says, yes, I quite agree. Who do you see in the role? And I said, Walter Koenig, Robert Blake. Bobby Blake from In Cold Blood, named a couple of other people. He says, yes, yes, oh, he would be terrific. Now, he gets very excited, and he says, uh, let's screen test those people, too, to Bob Klein. And Bob Klein says, oh, yes, oh, yes, of course we will. We got now, what I did not realize, and what I, mean, I cannot prove this, but I would be willing to bet every dime I have in the bank, and it is considerable at the moment, thank you, that they had already made a commitment to cure delay, and they were stuck with it, and there wasn't any way we were going to get anybody but cure delay. Yeah? So, we end the meeting. They go away. Klein says to me, Boy, you really threw me a curve. This is no more of a curve than you threw me coming up in the elevator. I says, Don't arbitrarily and unilaterally decide something and then expect me to be your slave about it. I says, Because that ain't where I'm at. I'm the creator of this particular dream, Jack, and I'm willing to make you a couple of million dollars, but you got to honor my creation. Well, that was only the beginning of the end. I also advised him at that point, this was in April, May, something like that, that the Writers Guild strike was about to come down on us. 
And if it came down on us, I was not going to write. No way. Well, well, we'll work around it. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it, says Klein. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Everything will be all right. Blah, 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 blah. He always does that. I said, okay, but be advised. I will not write. Writer's Guild strike starts. Bob Klein. At that point, I still had not gotten any money. This is now like three months into the goddamn project. He sold it to something like 48 NBC outlets, sold it to the entire Westinghouse uh, network, sold it to the Canadian television network, sold it all over the place, sold this goddamn thing on the strength of a 12-minute cassette. They began doing ads. They didn't even know what the ship looked like. They made it look like a big bullet. Now, you know, nobody has made a rocket ship look like a big bullet in 12, 15 years. Everybody knows they look different. They did this goddamn poster. It was so stupid. I can't, cannot believe it. Then the Writers Guild strike started. Then began a tale of terror, subterfuge, and horror, unequaled since Clifford Odette's The Big Knife. I mean, I've been out here 12 years, man, and I have worked for some of the, I mean, the scunge balls of the universe. <laughs> People who couldn't get their asses arrested on Skid Row. I have worked for them and been screwed by them, and even they, even they, did not sink to the levels that that I was forced to, 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 to work on. They began threatening me. Now, I will not accuse Mr. Klein of any of this. Mr. Klein, I'm not accusing you. Don't get your goddamn attorney's bowels in an uproar, Mr. Klein. Unnamed parties began threatening me, right? I better write. I damn well better write. There was a lot of money tied up in this. When are you going to write? Are you going to write? Let's have the treatment. We need a treatment. We need, they needed what they called the Bible. The Bible is the presentation of the series that outlines the characters, outlines the physical plan of the ship, outlines the direction the series will take. It is, in fact, the uh, blueprint, the template from which they make the entire series. They did not have this. All they had was this Fakakta 12-minute tape, which they had transcribed and made no sense at all. What I also did not know was that other people, including Mr. Preston Fisher, that's F-I-S, and it had been writing explanations of what I had said on this tape to send around to people so they could promote it. And they were, they had used the dumb name that I had had for this character. I don't remember, Vic. Oh, Vic it was. Yeah, Vic. he gave me a name, Vic Deluzio or something, you know, some crazy name like that. And this was going to be the hero, right? They didn't know about the character named Garth. They didn't know about Rachel. They didn't know any goddamn thing because it was all in my head. And I wouldn't tell them because the strike was on. And they were, they were writing all of these nitwit things and sending them around as though they were the word. So people were, people were programming it and, and announcing it. Vic Deluzio discovers the universe. You know, they were, Christ. Captain Rocket. Talk for a minute while I drink this. <laughs> this is KP of K in Los Angeles. The program is Hour 25. Science and science fiction. Our uh, guest tonight, monologist Harlan Ellison. <laughs> What's Bercocta mean? Listen, you asked. I'm. Uh, that's true. I'm not putting you down. There is no Incidentally, way... Incidentally, uh, Mr. Thong in there, he yeah. would like a uh, a uh, translation of Bercocta. <laughs> oh, Bercocta? Bercocta really means lost. Uh, and, uh, that's for Blungit. For Blungit is lost. Fakakta means, um, Fakakta is like, uh, like your Aunt Sadie, and it was like 92 degrees, and she came in her overshoes, her galoshes, that's Fakakta. Uh, nutty, dumb, crazy, stupid, pointless, imbecilic, fuck. Anyhow, I want you to know, Glad I asked. make a terrible grilled cheese sandwich. They don't melt the cheese. Um... I wouldn't go near that. What is that? Is that a... What kind of crap is that? Uh, we are listening to Harlan Ellison. He is telling the story of How we Star, got Lost over on the Star Lost with the emphasis on the lost. <laughs> and, uh, John Henry, just for your occasion, your attention, this story may not end at the designated time during which we will run over. Uh, oh, go ahead. This yes, is fascinating. absolutely. got to get this on the record. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I I, I I may be skipping some things in here, uh, and and later on I'll go back and I'll say, oh yeah, and this was also happening, but this is pretty much the way things were going. Um, around this time, I had stood up at a writers' guild meeting because we were on strike. You know, we were or, or we had been asking for a strike vote, and I said, uh, you know, I got a series that's gonna supposed to go on the air, and if we go on strike, it ain't going on the air. And even so, I ask you to you know strike. So you know, I was kind of a, a rallying uh, figure, you know, which was really you know heroic as hell. And and uh, so I was very involved in the in the in the guild thing. So I said to the scab writer, I said, "Man, what you're doing is you are strike breaking. 
There are men and women out pounding the goddamn bricks every day. They get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to be out there when the studio's open in the rain. This is an important strike. We've been, you know, we're really going for some important things here. This is not a matter of money. This is a matter of getting some rights for writers that they have long needed. And I said, and I, and I said would you come over to the house and talk to me? He said, yes, he would. He said he had been writing for 72 hours, and he had just finished a 60-page outline, a whole presentation, outlining characters, <coughs> blah, 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 the whole thing. He had put together the series based on, based on my 12-minute cassette, right? So already, they're screwing me around. Now, at this point, I dislike these people so much that I want the series to die. I don't want it to go on the air. I'm killing for myself maybe a quarter of a million dollars. Okay? So, he comes over to the house, and we sit and we talk for six hours, and I really laid it on him. I said, you cannot hand this thing in to them. If you hand it in, you are going to be fucking over everybody in the Writers Guild. You must not do this, man. You must not do it. He says, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I said, look, let me take you into the Writers Guild tomorrow and talk to Mike Franklin, the director. Talk to him, and you'll understand. So... He said, okay, next morning, and he, he, he locked in the trunk of his car the two copies of the Scab Bible, okay? Next morning, we have breakfast, and while I'm in his room, waiting to take him to the Writers Guild, I said, I'll prove to you that these people are liars and cheats and thieves. He said, how? I said, I will call Bob Klein. Bob Klein's guy who had hired him, Preston Fisher and Bob Klein. From his hotel room in the Beverly, whatever it is, over on Pico there, I don't know what it's called, something or other, the Beverly douchebag or something. <coughs> I call Bob Klein. Papa Dow is listening in on the phone in the bathroom, right? You can tell it's a Hollywood motel. There's a phone in the toilet. He's listening on the line, and I get Bob Klein on the phone, and I say, Hi, Bob. Hi, Harlan. How you doing, Bob? Well, we're not doing good, Harlan. Where is the Bible, Harlan? Well, Bob, you know there's a strike on. Well, I know, and we don't want you to write. What? No, we don't really want you to write. We want you to be honest and straightforward and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, Jesus, Bob, I'm glad to hear that that's the tack you're taking. I said, listen, I'm kind of worried. Are there any other writers writing on this series? I said, Bob, are there any other writers writing on this series? Let me put it this way, Bob. Are there any other writers currently writing on this series? No, there are no other writers writing on this series. There are no other American writers writing on this <laughs> series. I said, oh, are there any other uh, Canadian writers or Latvian writers or Israeli writers or anybody writing on this series? Uh, no. You mean there's no one else doing any kind of a Bible or a script or a presentation? No, no, we're waiting for you. We're, we're going to keep faith with you. No one is writing anything. Thanks, Bob. Good talking to you, Harlan. Bye, Bob. <laughs> Hang up. He comes out of the... Bob Dow comes out of the toilet. We look at each other. I say, I rest my case. He says, let's go to the Writers Guild. We go to the Writers Guild. Mike Franklin sits and talks to this dude for a while. He then turns over to me one of the two copies of the Scab Bible. He takes the other one with him and he goes back to Berkeley. Right? Now, all that day, Preston Fisher, Bob Klein, and Jerry Zeitman, Trumbull's partner are going bananas because they can't find a guy. They put him up in his motel and they can't find him. Where is he? Finally, they get a hold of his wife and she says, well, he went to see Harlan Ellison. <laughs> That's it. They call me. What did you do with him? What did you do with him? I said, I killed him, cut him apart, and I ate him. <laughs> they begin screaming at me and yelling, you son of a bitch, you son of a bitch. They're going out of their minds that no matter which way they turn, there I am, like an ominous specter in their lives, and they don't know what to do about it. They know that they can't beat me any other way, so they then go after Actra. And what happened was this. I, I presume what happened was this, and I was duped, too. Now, I had not written a word up to this point. <clears throat> Actra is composed 90% or 70% of actors, 30% of writers. Writers in Canada are a very small group. They are very limited. A man named Paul Siren, who was the director, and apparently they got to the actors, and they said, if this series opens up for you, 
it will have to meet what they call Canadian content standards, which means 98% of everything on the series has to be Canadian. Canadian actors, Canadian directors, Canadian writers, Canadian producers, Canadian production staff, everything Canadian has to be. They can have like one American actor and one guest, one regular and one guest star. They can have one American writer. I was to have been the American writer, okay? Now the Canadians see all of this work and they start pushing the actors start pushing, we want these jobs, we want these jobs, right? Actors would sell out their mothers for a dime. Anyhow, so, pressure keeps being put on actor, pressure keeps being put on. I keep getting calls and telegrams from clients saying, actor accepts it, actor accepts it. I said, I haven't seen any such indication. He says, I'll send you a copy of the telegram. <clears throat> what he sends me is a, a Xerox of something that he typed up in his office. I said, this is no proof. And what it said, one of them was, uh, actor thinks that it may be a Canadian production, and if it is, then they will not honor the Writers Guild strike, and they will put Canadian writers to work. Now, the minute they put Canadian writers to work, they'll come up with a scab Bible up there, and they'll begin doing segments, and it doesn't matter whether I'm on or off. But that's not the point. I would, I would still, you know, ethically, I would not go anywhere near it. Anyhow, finally, after many weeks and much aggravation, <coughs> They convince Actra that it is a Canadian-produced production that is being deficit-financed by CTV, that it's being produced at the CFTO studios, that the people putting up the money are Glenn Warren Productions, Ted Delaney, and that the only connection that 20th Century Fox has with it is as distributor down here in America. Okay, they start laying that on me. Now I'm getting in my head a little crazy. I figure, well, maybe it is Canadian because all of this information is coming out of Canada. And uh, uh, I say, well, if I get the word from Actra, then I will accept it. Telegram comes through. Actra accepts Canadian validity of this series, The Star Lost. Uh, Canadian writers will be put to work. I still didn't believe it. I had my agent, Marty Shapiro, call Paul Seren at Actra in Canada, in Toronto, or Ottawa, wherever it is. Toronto, I guess. And I listened in. And by God, he said, yes, we, it is Canadian production. We have satisfied ourselves that it is, everything is Canadian. That the only connection 20th has is in distributing it after the fact, after it's played on Canadian television first. So I figured, okay, I am ethically now bound to go to work on it. It's Canadian production. Called the guild and told them, don't do it, they said. I said, well, I, you know, they didn't really say don't do it. They just said, we, we would rather you didn't. I said, well, I have to. I now have to go. No, no, don't. You'll be brought up on charges. I could not believe that they would bring me up on charges. I mean, I was, I was on the, the board of directors. I was a staunch militant, you know, guild man. I was all for the strike. You know, I'd have, I'd have gone out and, I'd have wee weed on Lou Wasserman's <laughs> building if they'd asked. You know, I'd have done anything. <clears throat> had to go. I had a right. They needed the Bible. I sat down and I wrote the Bible. Good Bible, too. I said to Klein, I want you to promise me that the scab Bible will not be used. No, no, no one will see it, no one will see it. Footnote. I later found copies of that goddamn thing all over the place. And it was filled with, I mean, even, even Papadow, who had written it, hated it. And it was filled with androids and a guy who was half robot. And Hold it. Ba back off for a second. Uh, the guy in Berkeley who wrote it, this was the chap that you had talked to, who had listened in when, right. Uh, right. Uh, what's his name, said there are no other writers in the thing. Right. Uh, he had talked to the Guild, the Guild said no, he right. tentatively agreed. Right. He went back north and he took the one copy with him, right. Xeroxed it or Mimeoed it, and right. that was it. Right. Except, what I had said to him was, don't turn it in. If you don't turn it in and they don't pay you, I'll pay you the $2,000 out of my pocket, which he thought was cool. Uh, but they did get a copy of it, whether they got it from him or from, I don't know where, but they got it, they got a copy, and they Xeroxed the hell out of it, and it was all over the place, and it was full of erroneous, awful stuff. They also didn't pay him for a long, long, long time. Uh, they were always late paying everybody. Now, up to this point, I had not seen a dime either, right? Already they're, in, they're you know, they're talking about producing this goddamn thing, and they haven't paid the guy who thought it up. So I did the Bible, and I handed it in. Good Bible. 
Now I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of little screwing arounds here that, 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 that went on, of lies that were told, of this, of that, the other thing. Now, I say I want Walter Koenig to play the part of Garth. I created the part of Garth to be this peasant who could sit on the earth and cry. And, right? and they said, well, we may have to cast a Canadian writer, but a Canadian actor. I said, I'm sorry, man, I want Walter Koenig to play this part. That's who it's for. It's contrast to Cure Delay. Well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. We'll talk about it. We'll talk. Like when, you're, when you were 10 years old and you want to go to the movie, your mommy said, we'll see, we'll see, right? You never got to go to the movie. So, I go off to a writer's conference in Michigan. While I'm there, they're calling day and night, night and day, night and day, day and night. You go. You got to go up to Canada. You got to go up to Canada to write these scripts. You got to go up and work with the writers. You got to go interview writers. You got to go up to Canada. I said, I got things I have to do. You got to go up there. You got to go up there. Blah, 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 blah. They, one of the... I tell you what kind of people they are. They call. It was it was a writers' conference in the woods, well, way up in the, in the forest. They call the they call the the director of this place at three in the morning. He's asleep in bed. They say to this dude, uh, "We got to reach Mr. Ellison." Well, uh, Mr. It's three in the morning here. Well, uh, we got to talk to him. We got to talk to him. Well, uh, uh, he's he's about a half a mile away uh, in the in the in the in the woods. Well, uh, could you uh, could you uh, could you run over there? He says, yes, I, uh, I could run over there. I could also walk over there. He said, but I don't intend to do either. Fuck off. And he hung up on them. Right? They called back. They had no shame, no mercy. They wouldn't let me alone. Finally, I agreed when I got out of there, I would go directly to Toronto, and I would spend 10 or 12 days there working with the writers. Long story short, got up there, find that they have appointed a producer, a man who knows nothing about science fiction, but I mean nothing and knew little about television. His sole credit was that he had been producer on a series called Adventures in Rainbow Country, which had lasted, I think, 26 minutes and had died. There are now all kinds of people with their fingers in the pie. CFTO Studios, Glenn Warren Productions, CTV Network, NBC, 20th Century Fox, Bob Klein, Ted Delaney, and they all are going, yeah, 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 I mean, at once, because they all want to get in the act and they're all grabbing for the money, right? They put me in a miserable little hotel room. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's not, as they will be quick to tell you, it was an elegant hotel room at the Four Seasons Hotel, which is the biggest hooker haven in Toronto. Zaveria Hollander was there. I swear to you, Zaveria Hollander was there with three teenage hookers, and she was having large parties with Japanese transistor salesmen all the time <laughs> I was there. But did I get to get laid? No, I didn't get to get laid because I was busy writing. Uh, it's, it's appeared to me you've gotten laid several times in the course of this story so far. Well, and fuck, I... but not laid. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> There's a difference. Anyhow. I got news for you. This cold cheese sandwich is not altogether the best, terrific, most thing I've ever talked about either. Um, you enjoying yourself? Mm -hmm. That was Nori, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow. At, at about this point or a little earlier, I had insisted that they hire Ben Bova, the editor of Analog Magazine, Science Fiction Magazine, as the technical consultant on the series because we needed, um, we needed a, a science expert on it because I'm not that hot on that. And Ben had been hired earlier and Ben had come out to LA and had worked with me on putting together the, the ship. And we decided it should look like a bunch of grapes, and each grape was a biosphere 50 miles in diameter. And on and on and on and on. Tim Kirk did the illustrations for the Bible. They were really great. Mm. Bob Klein didn't like the drawings. He said, I don't like this guy's artwork. He liked better the big bullet. The big bullet he liked a lot. So, um, um, now Ben was supposed to come up to Toronto to work with me and help me you know, help me with plotting out the story. Because I found that what was happening with the Canadians was that they were nice people, but that they had never written episodic television and they didn't understand. Forget not understanding tele uh, science fiction. I mean, they just had no idea. They would come up and one person suggested a shoot. Tim Kirk did the illustrations for the Bible. They were really great. Mm. Bob Klein didn't like the drawings. He said, I don't like this guy's artwork. He liked better the big bullet. The big bullet he liked a lot. So, um, um, now Ben was supposed to come up to Toronto to work with me and help me, you know, help me with plotting out the stories. Because I, I found that what was happening with the Canadians was that they were nice people, 
but that they had never written episodic television and they didn't understand. Forget not understanding tele uh, science fiction. I mean, they just had no idea. They would come up and one person suggested a story about giant ants. Another one said, uh, how about the last two people left alive and they call each other Adam and Eve. Honest to God, they said these things to me. They set me up meetings with people. I met 24 writers in 12 and a half hours, 13 hours, a half an hour each. And I had a... I had to go on my gut instinct about who could write and who couldn't. And I'm feeding them ideas, and I'm feeding them ideas. And one guy will say, how about a talking plant? And I said, well, no, not a talking plant, but how about this? And I go, blah, 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 and my mind was really working. And I'm plotting out stories as I go along. And I'm sending them out and saying, why don't you go out and, you know, set that one down on paper. Now we find out that what they've decided to pay the writers. Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. The old top of the show for a one-hour television show in, in Hollywood was $4,500 to $5,000. Now it's something like six, seven thousand dollars since the strike. Okay, you know what they were going to pay for a full script, treatment, first draft, final draft? Take a guess how much they wanted to pay the writers on that show. Fourteen hundred. Seven hundred and twenty dollars. <gasps> what? Mm -hmm. Seven hundred twenty. Ten percent of the standard U.S. of the right. Now that's low even for Toronto. <laughs> Very low for Toronto. I mean, Canadian rates are lower, but they ain't that low. Call them up. And I said to them, either you up the money or I walk. Now, this dude that they had hired as producer, Bill Davidson, that's the one good thing he did. He, he stuck that fight out, too. He said he would walk off the series, too. And they went back into consultation, and they came up with $2,750 is what they pay for a script on that show. $2,750 for a one-hour script. Isn't that unbelievable? Anyhow, the writers were nice people, but just... They just... They just couldn't cut it. And I could see what was happening. And every day up there was, was, a, was a fight, trying to explain to these people, trying to explain to Davidson, trying to explain to the people of the CTV network. Ted Delaney, who was the head of Glenn Warren Productions, who was the producing agent, never called me, man. I mean, here I am, the guy who's going to make millions of dollars for him. It's my idea, my series. I'm brought up, I'm, you know, I'm, I own a piece of it. I'm a partner of his. He never called. He never said, welcome to Toronto. He never said, would you like uh, a cup of coffee? Nothing. Never talked to him. Never saw him. The utter disdain and disregard in which they hold creative people is so total and so complete. Producers, that is. People like Ted Delaney, who is the equivalent of Bob Klein. I mean, they are opposite numbers. He may be Canadian, but he is the same as Bob Klein. What but, about Trumbull and uh, Zeitman at this stage? Well... <laughs> Trumbull is trying to... Trumbull is down in the United States. He's on other projects. Zeitman is running around trying to act like a producer and he isn't doing diddly shit. Okay? Trumbull is uh, uh, about to come up and start building the ship, the models. Okay? But he hasn't yet. He's on these other things. He had been up there and had worked, with, had looked at the, at, the, at the facilities, the CFTO studios, and he was very enthused about them. So I figured, okay, it's going to work out. Now, they got me in this room. Not only am I meeting with writers constantly... Not only am I having these dumb meetings where they're giving me various dictum one after another, dicta one after another, but they want me to write the first script while I'm sitting there. I said, well, I need a typing table. Do you know it took them five days to get me a table? And even then it was the wrong height. I had to sit on telephone books. I mean, I'm a dwarf to begin with, right, but I still had to sit on, on, on telephone books. Couldn't get me a typewriter I wanted. Couldn't get, I said, I want a manual typewriter. They could not get me a manual typewriter. I can't work on an electric typewriter. Me either. I can't. The goddamn thing goes off like a machine gun when I rest my fingers on it. They couldn't get me one. I want an Olympia office standard. They couldn't find one in the entire entire Cana country of Canada. I said, send to Germany. Get me one. <laughs> they couldn't. In, in ten days up there, I wrote six pages. Now, that is no rate for me. I can write one act of a teleplay in a day. I can write 10,000 words in a night if I have to. I mean, if I'm pressed, I can do it. And they'll be good, kind of, they may not be the greatest writing in the world, but they'll be competent enough to shoot, okay? I was being driven madder and madder and madder. The writers start coming back with the ideas that I've given them. They look like spinach. I'm telling them over at the studio, I'm saying, God damn it, these people are having trouble. I need an assistant. I need someone to help me with these things. No, no, we can't hire an assistant. We're over budget now. We're over budget now. Blah, 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 blah. The only guys who were nice to me while I was there was a guy named Larry Herzog, who worked for the CTV network, who took me under his wing 
fantastic guy. He kept me from going insane. I swear to you. He took me out to dinner every night. You know, we went out and we'd go to Chinatown and eat. And a man named Murray Cherkover, who is the head of the CTV network. I mean, he's like Sarnoff up there. He is a gentleman, fantastic guy. Because at this point, I got word I was up on charges from the Writers Guild for strike breaking. And at that point, why don't you say a few words and I'll take a sip of my drink and then we'll get back in a cliffhanger. This is KPFK <laughs> in Los Angeles. You're listening to Hour 25, the program about science and science fiction. Our guest tonight, Harlan Ellison, talking about the Star Lost. And uh, in case you haven't guessed, we will not be taking phone calls tonight. The story is going to go its way uninterrupted. Uh, at its conclusion, we're going to hear a reading from... Uh, well, the reading will be my Mitchell Harding, but you'll hear some introductory words from John Henry Thong. Next week on Hour 25, uh, sort of the best of the Change of Hobbit benefit produced uh, for Hour 25 by Joe Adams, who uh, still owes me a grape soda. Okay. Uh, okay. Now I'm up on charges. Which is serious. I mean, nothing funny about that. As you may know, there were, there were people who were fined $50,000 and, ex and, and expelled from the guild. And uh, that's bad. And I didn't ask them if they'll hold off having the, uh, bring it up before the council until I get back. I was supposed to be back in a few days. They wouldn't. I sent a scathing telegram, furious with them, my own guild. I mean, if I was at least happy with my series, it would be worth it. But I'm not. You know, I'm, 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 in, I'm in great misery. Ben Bova comes up at that point, and we realize that we are going to have to plot out one of them from, from the get-go. So we begin plotting them out and putting them on cassettes and talking them, and talking to the writers just the way we are now, and saying, look, what you've done on this thing is such and such and such, and you're a nice guy, but for Christ's sake, you don't know anything about biology, so get yourself a good book on biology and do such and such. They wanted me to have 12 stories in work by the time I left. Okay. They never sent the cassettes to the writers. They transcribed them. From this, the Canadian writers got the feeling that I had been bad rapping them and saying that they didn't know how to write, they didn't know how to spell, blah, 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 blah. Now, whereas on a cassette I could say to a, to a guy, look, Fred, um, uh, uh, look, we, we talked about this yesterday afternoon. Now, God damn it, man, you've got to do something. You know, that's, you know, you're talking to a friend and saying it. When it's written on a piece of paper, it doesn't look that way. They never sent the cassettes. So now the Canadian writers are getting, Bill Davidson has got, Bill Davidson is spreading the, Bill Davidson is the producer that they had hired, this, 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 this jerk. They're spreading the word that I'm bad-mouthing the Canadian writers. Now I'm supposed to come back to L.A. on a Sunday morning. On Saturday night, my brother-in-law calls me from Miami, Florida, and my mother tells me my mother, who is 76, 77 years old, is terminal. She's about to die says, uh, better get down here fast. She's going. She's not going to live out the day. That's it. I call them up. I say, I've got to go back tomorrow. My mother's dying. The next morning, a man named Murray Arthur Weinthal, Arthur Weinthal, who is the liaison between the CTV network and Glenn Warren Productions, CFTO Studios, comes into my room, and I'm packing my bag. I'm packing. I'm going, baby. I'm going. He begins hitting the desk and saying, this is what you will do. You will stay here for another week, and you will write this script. You will put into work 12 more stories. You will work with the 12 writers you got in work now. You will this, you will that, you will the other thing. I say to him, I don't want this to come as a shock to your nervous system, my man. But my mother is dying. And I'm going. He says, we can't be concerned with that. I says, well, I'm going to tell you what you can be concerned with. you got six seconds to get your ass out of this room, or I put you through the fucking window into that swimming pool down below. You got that? He goes. I said, uh, we got some cassettes here with, this, with uh, some stories on them. Do you want them? I don't care what you do with them. I said, that's it, then. He says, that's it. I said, I'm off the project. You're off the project. I said, my own project. I'm off it. You're off it. I said, fine. I pull the project tomorrow. I haven't signed any contract yet. There was still no contract signed, and I still had no money. The only money I'd gotten had been travel money and expense money while I'd been in Canada for what I'd been doing there, right? I mean, I was supposed to be story editor and get, you know, weekly money and all like that. He, he says, I don't care. He goes away. Fifteen minutes later, as I'm finishing packing the bag, the phone rings. That's Preston Fisher. 
F I yes, who had come in from New York and was there all along and who had been the one who had sent him over to tell me that I would do this and I would do that. They said, well, blah, 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 what will you do? I said, what I will do is I will go see my mother, and then I will have a script for you by Thursday. I will write four acts of this script by Thursday, your pilot script. No, no, we have to have it tomorrow. We have to have it tomorrow. I said, you're not getting it tomorrow. That's it. So I won my way, such as it was. Went back to L.A., saw my mother, went to Florida, saw my mother, came back. Wrote the script, Phoenix Without Ashes, I called it. All of the titles of every one of the scripts had a mythological bent. Lazarus from the Mist, uh, Children of Medusa, Goddess to the Double X Chromosome, uh, uh, Prometheus, uh, something, I don't know, but all of them were like that. Nice stories. One of them was even How Rachel Loses Her Virginity. See, the basic idea of the series was that Garth was to follow them. That Garth has... Garth doesn't join up with them. Garth tracks them. And he wants to get the girl back. He doesn't love the girl. She doesn't love him, but he has to bring her back because his society says so. They destroyed that in the first show. Anyhow, I wrote Phoenix Without Ashes. I will happily, happily let you see the script anytime, and you can give your listeners an idea of how good or bad the script is. If I were to die tomorrow and go to the pearly gates, I would rest my case on that script. It's that good. Sent it to them. They loved it. They loved it. Terrific. Terrific. Two days later, we got some problems with it. What are the problems? Well, blah, 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 blah. We don't think the people should talk like Amish. We don't understand this. We don't want that. We don't like this. We can't do that. We don't want the other. I said, hey, look, uh, you know. Now begins some of the most imbecilic. By this, by this time, I had come back, and I, I did not want to be story editor anymore. I would not be story editor. I said, forget that. I walked away from something like $85,000. 85000 uh, That's a lot of bread. I walked away from all that. But I was still supposed to write five more scripts, six more scripts, something like that. They begin rewriting me. They begin telling me what they're going to do. Oh, oh, <laughs> wait, wait, one more, one more side note, which, 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 which is fascinating. They were very high on a writer named Norman Klenman. They were high on Mr. Klenman because Mr. Klenman had left Canada to write American TV. I could not remember anything Mr. Klenman had written, and his name was not familiar to me, but they told me how good he was. They wanted him to write for the series because he was, an, he was equipped to write American TV, but he was a Canadian, so he was acceptable to the Canadian content people in the Ottawa offices, right? Clenman calls me from Vancouver the day I got back, and he says, uh, Mr. Olson, this is Norman Clemens, and Mr. Clemens, I'm very happy to talk to you. I'm writing a script right now. What can I do for you? He says, well, he says, I've read your presentation. I find it very difficult to understand. I really don't understand it. And very, very, very difficult to handle. He said, I don't know anything about science fiction. I want you to know that. He says, but uh, if you want to train me to write this, I will be happy to, to, to write for you on this series, but you'll have to pay me the top of the show that American uh, Guild is getting now, right? The American Guild, we were over the strike at this point. Uh, I said, well, look, Mr. Clement, i got to write a script right now. I haven't got time to train you. I'll talk to you, you know, as soon as I can. And, you know, when you get back in the States, call me. Norman Clenman is the man they hired to be the story editor who rewrote my first script. The man who said he did not understand science fiction and thought my presentation was very difficult to understand. Okay. So now I'm back in the States. Clenman has been hired. I am not... I'm supposed to write more scripts. They begin giving me phone calls. The phone calls are such as this. Bring. Hello. Harlan. Yes. Bill Davidson up in Toronto. Hello, Bill. What's the matter? we got serious problem. Serious problem. What's the problem, Bill? Oh, the problem is very, very serious. Yeah, I know, but what is the problem? Well, we find that we can't shoot Doug Trumbull's biospheres at 50 miles. Everything gets very hazy on the horizon. I said, that's what things are supposed to do on the horizon, get very hazy. So yeah, but it gets all muddy. You can't see what anything is. So we're going to have to make the hor we're going to have to make the biospheres on the spaceship six miles in diameter instead of 50. I said, well, Jesus, if you do that, I said, it's going to mean rewriting 
half the pilot script because uh, at one point he hides out in the uh, in the hills. I said, in a 50-mile biosphere, you can hide out in the mountains. I said, in a six-mile biosphere, all you have to do is link hands and walk across it, for Christ's sake. I said, it's not logical. Oh, no, I don't know the difference, don't I? I said, yes, people will know the difference. They'll, they'll realize that, that it isn't logical. And you must have an, a rigorous interior logic in science fiction. It's not like a Western or a detective story where you can, you know, fidget and play Mickey Mouse. Well, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. And then it suddenly dawned on me. I said, wait a minute. I said, you're photographing something no one has ever seen before, a biosphere. Everything looks like mud on television anyhow. I said, shoot de facto six miles if you want to and tell them it's 50. Who the hell's going to know the difference? Who can tell the difference between six miles and 50 miles when you're looking at it on a television screen? He says, I never thought of that. I said, goodbye, Bill. Next phone call was he says to me, you're going to love one of the sets we're building. We're building the bridge. I said, you're building the bridge? What are you building the bridge for? You don't need it until the fourth or fifth year of the series. That's the Maltese Falcon. That's what they have to find to get the ship back on course. Oh, no, no. You're it's right, in your, right in your presentation, right in your Bible there. I said, it's in there because that was to tell you where the series was going at the end. What they have to find are the engines, the drive chambers, the central computer banks, and the bridge. The bridge is the Maltese Falcon. Once they find the bridge, the series is over. Oh, no, no. They then have to find the backup bridge. I said, Bill, do you know what a backup bridge is? The backup controls? He said, no, what is it? I said, it's when your primary fails, it's your secondary, dummy! And then if they find that, it's the... that's nothing! Oh, I didn't know that. I said, well, then why didn't you call Ben Bova and ask him? I didn't think of it. Well, you know, we're awfully busy up here. We, uh, not enough paper clips. We had to do a lot of, uh, business on... I said, don't build the bridge. You don't need it for four years. If you're pressed for money now and you're building the goddamn bridge, you're wasting money. Oh, okay. They went ahead and built the bridge and put it not only in the first episode, but it's the very first shot of the thing. Right? So in other words, the series is over. The instant they open it, down the tube. Just like that. Well, it went on and on like that. When I saw what they were doing to the script, I said, I will give you no more scripts. I will deliver no more scripts. I do not want my work fucked up anymore. Phoenix Without Ashes was retitled. And, 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 and when people say, what did they do to your series? This is the clearest example. Phoenix Without Ashes, which is a nice title, was retitled The Voyage of Discovery. Does that sparkle? Does that burn? Does that compel you with its urgency? Huh? They screwed up the characters. They changed everything. I mean, the Amish society they were supposed to come from. I mean, they had them wearing weird kind of clothes. I mean, the Amish, to my certain knowledge, have not changed their clothing styles in 400 years. And they had them wearing these weird, peculiar outfits. They broke logic constantly and consistently. I mean, they got a big door sitting. I had the hatch that he falls through hidden in the ground. And he stumbles over it by, by accident in a, in, a, in, a, in a shrubbery. They got it up on a wall. Beyond this point lies death, right? And no one was ever curious enough in 900 years to go through there, right? Not only that, but there's an old man sitting there. What does the old man do? He just, I don't know what's going on back there, but it's evil, evil. Right? Not only that, but they never showed the script to Ben, who was supposed <coughs> to be the science consultant. And the first episode, which they just mucked up awfully, has some schlep saying... We are plunging into a solar star. <laughs> a solar star, friends. For those of you who are sitting out there in radio land looking perplexed, let me tell you, a solar star is the only kind of star. Solar means sun, means star. Star means sun. So what they were saying is, he's a nice fella guy. I live in a big house home. Oh, look at my car automobile. Do you understand now? Solar star is illiterate gibberish only superseded in stupidity and illiteracy by some of the subsequent things. For instance, we, in Lazarus from the Mist, where we had a guy revived, he was supposed to be dying of cancer, a uh, uh, heart, heart attack. He had had a coronary, and he was going to die. No, no, they don't want to have a coronary. Why? At 7 o'clock. No, no, not good at 7 What? People don't have heart attacks at 7 o'clock? What's the matter? Who's going to offend? The heart attack patients? You know, Christ. So they made it into radiation plague. Radiation plague. Ben Bovitt said to them, there is no such thing as radiation plague. You can't have a radiation <laughs> plague. And he gave them 12 Atomic other alternatives rats. that they could have used. Did they do it? No. On the series, some guy says, I'm dying from radiation plague. Right? There was also a, a terrific, I never saw this, but people call me up and laugh at me because they think I wrote it. They say, 
Hey, dummy, somebody was sick with space senility. Space senility. What is space senility? It's like old space, doddering old space. Hello there, I'm an old space. I'm so, right? It's like a solar star as opposed to a movie star, right? Really? God knows. Anyhow, Ben Bova sent them a tele... He saw his first episode, I think last week, sent them a telegram and said, take my name off it. He doesn't want to be associated with it. I, when I saw what they had done to the script, said, take my name off it. You will not use my name. Now they get furious. We want to use your name because the Star Trek people know about your credentials and they know that you've been written for Star Trek and we need that to promote it. I said, up your tuchus, Charlie. You ain't using my name no how. Huh? So I took my name off and I put on it my pseudonym, which I've only used twice before on television, Cordwainer Bird. The bird is as in flipping the or for the. Huh? Anyhow, when they heard that, they went bananas. I said, oh, yes, I can. It's registered with the Writers Guild. It's in my contract. Just check it out. They checked it out, and they had to use it. Every week, folks, you will see Cordwainer Birds, The Star Lost. I have nothing to do with the series. I want nothing to do with it. I don't watch it myself. I just wouldn't watch it. I get furious when I do watch it. Uh, it is directed by people who have no sense of direction. It is the slowest goddamn talkie show. Doug Trumbull was booted off the show. Magic Ham never worked. Never worked. That's all the Canadians' production techniques that you're seeing there. The whole goddamn thing looks like it was shot inside an, uh, one of those plastic egg crates. Uh, they, they, they stand on a wide vista, and you can see it's a painted backdrop right behind them. Uh, Keir DeLay mumbles in his beard. Um, uh, Bill Davidson directs, uh, you know, out of his left ear. And uh, if they say that it's getting the highest ratings in the universe, I imagine those remarks are coming from Mr. Robert Klein. Who, if he told me the sun was shining, I would go out and check. Uh, and that's pretty much where it stands well, at this point. I, one more loose some, end. Why don't you take some phone calls? All right, I want, I want to tie up one more loose end. Tie How do you stand with the guild? Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, the guild, I went, I went up on trial. They did bring me to trial. And all charges were dismissed. I was tried by a, judge, a jury of, uh, of uh, I guess it was five or six very prestigious writers who were members of the guild themselves. And all charges were dismissed. Have you been paid by anybody yet? Have I been paid by anybody yet? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what he asked. Yeah, uh, I had to really grind them for the money. And the way I ground them for the money was by threatening them with uh, uh, bad wrapping them. And uh, they, they paid me the money, and uh, as you can see, I am not bad wrapping them. I learned at their knee, if I am a rotten, vile person, it is because I learned from them. Except a few calls. I'd like to hear from a few people. Okay, all right. Should I put on the earphones to hear the calls? Uh, that won't be necessary. Those we'll hear on the speakers. Okay. If you would like to uh, check with Harlan on this, the telephone numbers to call are 877-2711, or from uh, the San Fernando Valley or Malibu, 984-2711. The area code, if you're calling from Toronto, is 213. By the <laughs> way, you know, there's, there's something else. The thing that really saddens me is that occasionally someone will tell me, Oh, gee, I really liked it. I really liked that story. And I say to myself, why did I walk away from $85,000? Because most of the people who watch television, they don't know shit from Shinola. They will take crap and not demand anything better, and they just don't know any better, and they don't care. But I hate the series, and I hope those of you who watch it, who are pissed off by it and insulted by it, write to them. Write to them. Write to the station. Write to the, write, write to the, um, the advertisers. And, yeah, right. Write to the sponsors. Write to the sponsors, and tell them how bad it is. Before we go to the calls, uh, <laughs> I have one minor protest that I personally would like to register. One of my favorite authors is Cordwainer Smith, and my only complaint with you is that you use Cordwainer. Chose to use Cordwainer. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I talked to Cordwainer Smith's widow just about a week or two ago, uh, Mrs. Linebarger, and uh, she understood why I had used it. I admire Cordwainer Smith almost outrageously, and I used it as a tribute to him. The bird part is, I mean, it's, it's like they're separable. The Cordwainer is a tribute to him, and the bird is the, the bird. So... Okay. I, I meant no. I meant no disrespect to Cordwainer Smith. Good, because if I thought you had, I mean, just mm -hmm. would punch my body. Yes, well. severely. Okay, we have a number of calls, so we'll take these. The five calls are on the line, and then ah, the boards are really lit up, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the studio is not that cool either. Keep, uh, KPFK, keep. you're on the air. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I call up uh, at least once a week. <laughs> a little louder. Okay. I call up uh, every every time you people are on the air, and I've always. Uh, why don't you go out and get an honest job? <laughs> <laughs> no, I call up and uh, I put down that Star Lost uh, farce a couple times when I did call. 
and I'm really glad to hear that it's coming out in the open. It's just a sad fact that the money uh, controls the, uh, the business of uh, science fiction. It's just sad. And uh, I hope that in the future there can be another series made and uh, maybe we can get all together, everybody that likes science fiction can get together and do something about all this crap and corruption and uh, take all this shit off the air and let, let's get something good on the screen. You Sir? Know. Yes. Harlan has just spent an hour and 20 minutes telling you why the, ch the odds are that that's not going to happen. Let me send you to the textbooks. <laughs> there is a book called Only You, Dick Daring. It's written by a guy named Merle Miller. It appeared in 1964. And if you can find it in a used bookstore, find it and read it. And then uh, I would suggest that as a rational human being, the only recourse left is to burn your set. <laughs> I never watched that crappy show anyway, but I did enjoy Star Trek when it was uh, in full bloom. And uh, it's just a sad thing. It makes me very sad that uh, they can't really get it going. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Hour 25, you're on the air. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment that... Uh, now, it was interesting to listen to what you uh, said about the way the show was originally planned, but in, I watched the show, and so have my kids, and we've enjoyed it, because when you watch it, you have to ask yourself, you know, is it good or bad compared to what? And compared to uh, most of what else is on television, it's pretty good. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard, sir. I know it is, but that's it, the way it is. It, 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 it means literally that... I don't know. I, look, it's uh, you're probably a very nice man. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to put you. Down. I honest to God, I'm not trying to insult you, but I, I think your tastes have been so debased that you will take that kind of thing, where you should be demanding more and better. You're accepting scraps off a table, and it's so sad. It's not a case of accepting. You you turn it on and you watch it, or you turn it off and you don't watch it. You know, Nicky Johnson was uh, was the commissioner of the FCC for. Yeah, I know. Well, he tried to, you know. Right. Things and, and he wasn't terribly successful. And uh, I think, you know, it's one of those things where it's gotten, it's gotten, the medium's gotten debased to the point it's at. There are very few bright spots, but basically it's, it's what it is. And, and, and uh, I feel uh, uh, very hopeless about the possibilities for improve, improving the medium through. Uh, well, you know, ex ex listen, excuse me, that you should not give up. Look, I don't give up, for God's sakes. If anybody should be, you know, browbeaten and, and crushed to a point where I say just, you know, screw it, it should be me. But I don't, because I look at things like My World and Welcome to It, The Waltons, yes. Kung Fu, MASH, you look at those shows and you say, and, and all in the family too, and you say, God damn it, somebody is making it, somebody is doing it, and when you see something like that, something that really pleasures you, you should support it. You should demand it. And when they mess you over and when they give you something silly and dumb like The Star Lost, you should say, no, I, you know, write to the sponsor and say, I'm never going to buy Drano again. Okay, but then what you end up with is another, another uh, time slot for I Love Lucy. No, that's not so, because they're, they, they can only do that so often. FCC demands that they're doing original programming, and they've got to do it. And they've got to keep, keep working up new things. So, okay, maybe season by season, you know, you're not going to have 100% good. But look, what, what art medium is 100% good? 90% of all books are crap, 90% of all movies are crap, 90% of all ballets are crap. So 90% of all television is crap. If you look in your TV guide, you can program yourself out 10% of what's on the air, and that will really enrich you. There are really fine things on television from time to time, and it's, it's not hard to find them. But, but it seems to me that to accept the Star Lost only because it's there and it's the best of a bad lot is to, is to discount yourself, is to sell yourself cheap. Furthermore, it's doing one other thing, and it's reinforcing what low quality there is. If you do not set high standards, you cannot get upset when uh, they feed you the lowest common denominator stuff. See, if that, if that series succeeds, then for all the errors they've made, and now they are really suffering, like all of the scripts that I promised them were going to come in and be garbage that have come in, they've had to rewrite every single one of them. They're screaming. I'll t oh, fa fascinating epic fascinated sir listen to this they called gene roddenberry who produced star trek and who's doing genesis 2 they called him about six eight weeks ago and i got the word from somebody in his office they called him preston fisher you know how to spell that fisher called him and said come up to toronto and produce it we're dying we don't know what to do we'll give you 50 percent of the series and gene laughed at them and said what do i want 50 percent of your dumb series for when i got 100 percent of two of my own 
And they said, well, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And Fisher said, well, is there anybody you can recommend who could produce the series for us properly? And Roddenberry said, yeah, I got just the guy. And they said, who? They said, Harlan Ellison. If you hadn't fucked him over, he'd have done a good job for you. And he hung up on him. <laughs> now, I've heard that from his own office, not from Gene, because he was away, but, but from, his, from, from, from people who were in the office who heard the call. They are, they are suffering and they are dying. Walter Koenig, I finally got on the series. I bludgeoned them into using him to play a part of an alien that I had written. And, and they didn't even do the alien the way I wrote him. They made him a kind of a junior league Mr. Spock. And Walter came back from his first, doing his first show up there. And though he didn't say it, I got the impression that the show that he had done, which is going to be on tomorrow night, and I'm really terrified to see it, and so is Walter, that it was amateur night, little theatrics night. And they're, they're in deep trouble. They shoot a show one week, and they have to have it on the air the next. There's okay, no time. but you know what the conclusion's going to be? The conclusion's going to be, oh, yeah, well, science fiction just doesn't play anymore on television. Good. That's, that's the conclusion. Good. So you get nothing. Thank God. The less they have to fuck around with science fiction, the better I like it. Let them stick with the crazy cop shows. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Thank you for calling. Hour 25, you're on the air. Hi, Mike. Um, Hello, Bill. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to thank Harlan for telling us the truth behind the disaster. And I'd, I'd like to ask him a question, if I may. Sure, go ahead. How common is this experience that you've had? Very. In other words, you're simply the first to, to really protest. Oh, I'm not even the first to protest. God, there have been writers who've been protesting all, you know, you know, right from the right from the get-go. But, but I guess nobody is as big a mouth as me. And and see, the thing is, most most everybody gets frightened in this business. What what they have told me now is, if I continue running my mouth, oh, no, I just won't work in the industry again. I had another series that was with NBC. <laughs> and it got killed out of hand. I mean, everybody was very high on it and wanted to do it, and it was suddenly killed. I suspect uh, the people at NBC are uh, are telling me, Ellison, shut your mouth. Um, and essentially, you have only three places to work in, in this business. Exactly. There are three networks. You get killed on them, and you're dead. But, well, what the hell? You know, to let Visigoths order you around and frighten you is silly. I'm not, I'm not worried. They kick me out of TV. I can always go back to writing books. They kick me out of books. I can write short stories. Kick me out of that. I'll go back to bricklaying, for Christ's sake. I'm a good bricklayer. Bricklaying? Yeah. I thought so, you were a tank driver. Tank driver? Weren't you in the armored force? I was. How did you know that? You've told us in every one of your uh, introductions. I have never mentioned driving a tank in my life. I was, I was in the U.S. Army Armor Center in the Fort Knox, but uh, my tank experiences I will not talk about. <laughs> I, I have never talked about that, sir. What did you <laughs> None of your or business, who? smart ass. Leave me alone. <laughs> okay, well, we have a number of calls, Bill. We are going to move on. Thank you for calling. Incidentally, you missed a great show Sunday. I'm sure I did, but I had other work to do when I was on a computer. It happens. Thank you very much for calling. Hour 25, you're on the air. Yeah, Mike. Uh, yes? Uh, see, to hit off the subject of Star Lost, uh, the Star Trek Tomorrow Morning is written by Walter Koenig. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it was in the, it's Walter uh, Koenig down on NBC. Tomorrow's Walter's big day. He's, he's on Star Trek in the morning, and he's on Star Lost at night. <laughs> How terrible! Oh. It's it's really funny. You know, Walter thought they got it. They got him so confused. They they told him that his show was going to be on day. last Saturday, so he called up two thousand agents and everybody to watch it. And it wasn't his show. And he <laughs> called me and he said, "Did you watch the show?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "God, the makeup job is terrific. It makes it look just like Simon Oakland." He says, "God damn you, <laughs> Koenig for a day. Check your Danish." Yeah, and also, did, did you write any scripts for the animated Star Trek? No, I have not. Are you planning to? No, I am not. Uh, okay. Last question is, what do you think of the animated Star Trek? Uh, well, uh, you know, they keep saying, don't call it a cartoon, call it animated, but it looks like a cartoon to me. Um, you know, I guess that's heresy. I, I've watched it once, and, uh, uh, I guess for cartoons, it's, it's pretty good. I, uh, uh... If I had my choice of the Star Trek or the Roadrunner, I, I guess it would be Roadrunner. I'm sorry, I, I'm not that high on it. But I wish them well. Uh, one of my dearest friends, Dorothy Fontana, is producing it. And uh, Gene and I have reached rapprochement. And I wish him well, and I wish everybody else well. And uh, uh, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't watch it, but that doesn't mean much of anything. Okay, thank you for calling. Yeah? Bye. Goodbye. Hour 25, you're on the air. Yes, <clears throat> I would just like to say that uh, I watched or tried to watch the first episode of The Star Lost, and it was so bad, so bad, that I couldn't continue watching about halfway through the show. I just had to flip it off. Uh, I, 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 and it's extremely interesting to hear this account because uh, my wife and I wondered, uh, how is it 
that something so slow, so rotten, so stilted, and so uh, stupidly created could uh, be on the air. It has to rank with Gilligan's Island, and I think I would prefer to watch Gilligan's Island. Me too. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's... Um uh, it's being done by people who do not understand science fiction in even the slightest regard, and they continue to flout all the laws of logic that are inherent in that kind of script. And eventually, you just say, "This cannot be," and you and you and you 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 laugh at it because what they're trying to do is they're trying to put one over on you. Well, how could how could people that are that are reasonably intelligent? view something like that and say we're going to put it on the air. I mean, it's to any reasonable... There's too much money involved. There's, exactly. There's a fortune involved, and these people want that money, and they don't give a damn what they put on as long as they fill that hour. And that's the <coughs> truth. <coughs> that's I see. Uh, what kind of ratings does it have now, or is there any figure on that? Yeah, there was an ad that appeared in the tr trades today, as I said when we began the program, and I cannot recall the numbers. Well, as I recall, they said that it was first in the ratings, I guess in that time slot, in uh, in New York and L.A. But when you stop to think about it, what it's up against is, uh, you know, uh, a live broadcast of the dog show from the arena and uh, uh, Zen Knitting or something. <laughs> Look, you know. uh, I'd like to ask you this. Do you recall there was a science fiction show on television... When I was a kid, this must have been in like 1952 or 3, and I believe it was called something like... Tales of Tomorrow. Science right. Fiction Theater. Either that or... Either that or... Science Fiction Theater. Well, there was... There was X-1, there was Tales of Tomorrow, there was... Um, there was a very short-lived one, or lived one, whichever it is, that, that Roald Dahl did, and I can't... This was the one, for example, one of the shows was where the pods landed on Earth and they opened up and multiplied, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it's that story, but... It's the Invasion of the old. Body Snatchers, it's a movie. Yeah, well, that's, that's a movie, that's the Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's a weekly series, and it was extremely well done, it's <coughs> like 19... Uh, 52. Oh, wait a well, minute. You're probably talking about Outer Limits. No, no. No, no. No, no. Predates that. Predates was that. Was X minus one on television? Yes, it was for a while. And uh, then it was X minus one. Okay. Okay. What, Thank uh, you for going, Al. I see. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> Think goodbye. Hour 25, you're on the air. Oh, Harlan, I managed to get through two episodes of Star Lost before I exceeded my regurgitation quotient. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a hearty soul, sir. Thank God you weren't in a space suit. That's the uh, first and third... And uh, what really turned me off on the series was the third third series. Uh, they had a really powerful idea of a, of a backup crew, forgive me, on the backup bridge yeah. that uh, uh, was suspended physiologically as children for 900 years. And this struck me as an idea. It was my idea. I wrote that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I kind of thought, you know, it was a powerful idea that any good writer could turn into a hell of a tale. And then they did nothing. They made them children of... Uh, mental age, right. same as their apparent phys physiological age, did nothing with right. the idea. I, I was just wondering how you would have treated it if you'd gotten the right script. Well, the uh, the way we did it was uh, Ben Bova and I plotted that out, and we, we thought we had a very uh, very nice idea. They they um, were, we, we, we patterned it. Did you ever read Jerry Bixby's story, It's a Good Day? Uh, I think so. Uh, it, they, they were kind of, they were, uh, all powerful children. I mean, they had amazing powers, and they uh, they they treated them as children. They didn't realize the the potency that they had, and uh, uh, we went for a kind of a uh, it was a hard edged story. There was no you know no saccharine mawkishness to it. Now I didn't see the way they did it, but I know they rewrote it considerably. So I have no idea the way they handled it. <laughs> Kindergarten level. No oh, crazy. Bad. I apologize for them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I want to put in a plug before we go to our next call, uh, the, the Bixby story that uh, you just mentioned, where you got the idea for that. Uh, Catherine Culkin did a reading. Oh, if it's, it's a, a good, good life. life. It's a know? good life. It's yeah. Called, yeah. Beautiful story. Really nice. Okay. Hour 25, you're on the air with Harlan Ellison. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Mike. There's Elliot Chang. Yes, Elliot. Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask Harlan uh, how many uh, episodes have been done of uh, Star Wars so far. I have no idea. I, re I, I, I swear to you, I, I disassociated myself utterly. 
They don't call me. I don't talk to them. I have nothing to do with them. The only time I hear from them is when I hear a scream of outrage when one of my uh, when one of my blasts reaches print or, or or goes on the air or something. I mean, I'm sure they'll hear about tonight. Well, is it possible that we uh, may be blessed with a cancellation uh, before the end of the season? I don't know. I think they I think they had what the hell was it? I guess it was 16 or 18 with a pick up to 23 for the first season, I think. Now, I don't even remember that very clearly. Now, blissfully, a lot of this has been blotted from my memory. Um, if they don't get picked up after the first 16 or so, then yes, it will be canceled. Oh, well. Oh, by the way, by the way, this is an interesting thing. I sold a series of Star Trek, uh, Star Trek, Jesus, guys tear my tongue out, Star Lost novels that will be done by uh, pocketbooks. And the first one is going to be based on my script, Phoenix Without Ashes, and it's going to be written by Edward Bryant. And it's really going to be sensational because Ed's a brilliant, brilliant writer, and uh, we just got the contracts in. And, of course, they are hoping that the series will go. And in that way, I'm kind of hoping, too, because what it'll say on the cover is The Star Lost, created by Harlan Ellison, Phoenix Without Ashes by Edward Bryant. And inside, I will write an introduction that will do all of what I have done here tonight in the book you see. <laughs> and then it will be in print forever and ever. I'm also doing an article for TV Guide at the moment about this period. And the name of the article, I, I think it's the best title I ever came up with, except I didn't really come up with it. I think Jim Sutherland came up with it, but I'm not quite sure. But the, the name of it is called Somehow Toto, I Don't Think We're in Kansas. That's a graffiti <laughs> from KPFK's wall. No, that cannot be. It was. Uh, honestly, it don't really was. Don't shake your heads. I don't want to hear that. I don't <laughs> want to hear it, that. No, it's a great title. And, uh, anyhow, anyway. it's a great title for that particular article. Yeah. When they see that one, boy, Robert Klein... Hey, well, listen, would everybody out there in Radio Land write a rotten letter to Robert Klein at 20th Century Fox, Hollywood, California? That's K-L-I-N-E. <laughs> Robert Klein. K-L-I-N-E. 20th Century Fox. we know Fox, him, Michael? Uh, uh, Hollywood, California. As a matter of fact, I don't think we do. John Henry, but uh, we uh, we might just write a, write a terrible thing, uh, Mr. Klein. We don't like your clothes. Uh, you wear you wear loud cufflinks. Uh, you're not an honest man. Uh, get out of the business quick, or you will die. Send him uh, send him letter bombs, nail files, ground oh, wait glass. A no, 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 don't send him. Those. I'm I'm sorry. That's not <laughs> with our I'm, audience. That's a dangerous thing. Yes, that's do. right. You got a nut audience. I forgot. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Jesus, don't do that. God, he'll sue me for eighty billion dollars now. Listen, I got another television series that's good, that that I'm doing for ABC, which is looks like it's going to be okay. So uh, uh, hang in there. Wait for that one. It's uh, based on a story that Ben Bova and I did in Analog called Brillo. It's about a robot. Uh, a robot cop oh, yeah. who goes out with a Polish cop named Mike Polchik on the beat one night. If you picture William Bendix out covering a beat with a with a vacuum cleaner, you'll know what the series is about. And it's really nice. Bendix, and, huh? Yeah. Mm. Well, he's dead now. I was, no, I was just thinking of the Bendix washers. <laughs> uh, actually, I was thinking of Eli Wallach in the role of Mike Polchik. But no, no, don't, don't, don't send anything to Klein. Ignore Klein, okay? Just ignore Klein. Uh, see if it goes away. Yes? Yes, sir. <coughs> we have a caller. I've forgotten. Yes, Elliot, go ahead. Michael, I can't shorten this tape coming up. I know. We'll be off in four minutes. Go ahead. Oh, you're going to be off in the hour in four minutes. Okay. No, no, no. The live portion will be off. Then you'll get a reading. Best part of the program comes on in four uh, minutes. I mentioned that uh, uh, my program, or maybe you can make a mention of it, will be on all week. <laughs> on? Who is this? Um, this is a gentleman by the name of Elliot Chang who has done one of the most dangerous things I've ever heard of. He went out with Theta Cable Public Access, taped a 30-minute videotape out at uh, Filmation, where they're filming the animated Star Trek. He interviewed Dorothy Fontana and Hal Sutherland, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be on the Public Access channel of Theta Cable. I don't know what ch channel that is. Hell or something. Uh, one of the, this is the big time. All, the, all next week, Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock. Why is that dangerous? Because he is trying to put science fiction into television in Los Angeles uh, in a sort of an hour 25 format, in a 30 or 60 minute thing. Oh. And that's dangerous. And at any rate, we're going to have to move on, Elliot, but thank you very much for calling. Okay, thanks for the plug. Hour 25, you're on the air. Uh, hello. Have uh, you noticed I that no women call? Yeah. How strange. You scared them all off. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I just finished uh, my uh, nasty letter to. Uh, Bob Klein. <laughs> and then it is the final script for Star Loss, and that's when the intelligent life from the uh, Solar Star Class G system universe they're headed for from the planet Harlan Ellison is going to uh, destroy the ship out of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, let me, let me tell you another thing. They are so illiterate that I said the sh they kept saying, they, at first they thought the Star Lost was the name of the ship. 
And I said to them, no, it is not the name of the ship. They said, well, what's the name of the ship? I said, the ship doesn't have a name. It's just an ark. So they then they said, we have to have a name for it. I said, but there is no name. It's just, just an ark that they launch. I mean, they don't need a name for the goddamn thing. And they said, so now they call it Spaceship Ark. <laughs> I'm taping every episode. I'm bearing up just so I can make a about a five-minute uh, episode at the end of the series for the whole story. Oh God, give give them hell, boy! If anybody can give those clowns hell, see the only thing I the only thing I live for is that crazed science fiction fans are going to get at them and start mailing them bricks or something. You know that'd be. It, it, it's open to so much satire. It's just too much. It's ludicrous. Okay. Really. Thank you for calling. Hour twenty-five. You're on the air. First of all, I am a woman, and I am calling, so you didn't frighten all of us off. Hello there, woman. Hello there. Okay, I kept reading in TV Guide, you know, oh boy, a show by Harlan Ellis and everything, and then I see it, and I'm thinking, oh my God, he wrote this? Brain damage had set in. <laughs> so I'm glad you finally cleared that up. And what I was wondering about was uh, the episode you did write for the original Star Trek. Uh, I heard that that was changed a lot. I was wondering if you could give us, give me a little uh, background on that, you know, what happened. Well, I would ordinarily, but it's, first of all, we've only got a few minutes, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an old story, and it was a, a kind of bitterness that I held on to for a long time, but, but Gene, uh, as I say, Gene did a very kind thing for me when he turned down the, uh, the Star Lost offer, and so I would just as soon not talk about that. I, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't go into it. Okay. Thank you very much for calling. And Harlan, thank you for coming down tonight and telling us about and Star Wars. And ranting and raving and... Well, that too, yeah. Venting my spleen, as it were. Yes, and we'll s clean it off the windows and send you a <laughs> bill or something. Okay, babe. Uh, one more project, and we'll let you go. You mentioned Dark Forces a while back. Whatever happened to that? Dark Forces, we got the money to go to script on it. Uh, we did the script, and NBC turned it down about two weeks ago. Uh, I think Screen Gems is now going to try it at ABC. I don't know. It's a it's a beautiful, beautiful script. Larry Brody and I wrote a really fine script. Right now, my major project is Brillo. Brillo, I'm starting the script on. I have to have the script finished by November. They want it shot and in their hands by mid-February, which means it'll go on the air sometime in February or March, and if it gets any kind of rating at all, it will be a series next year. And boy, that would be fine, because the, I'm, I'm in a lot of control on that one. <clears throat> well, who knows? At this point, I'm in a lot of control, you know. But by, by Thursday, I may not be in any control at all. May, we, we may invite you back in six weeks and tell the story again, just changing the names. Right. Now, thus far, the people who are doing it are Alan Landsberg Productions, who did the Glass House Truman Capote's show. Uh, they did the In Search of the Ancient Astronauts. Oh, yes. They are really a fine, fine operation. The uh, uh, the guys that will be producing it are Alan Landsberg, Larry Savadov, and Ron Lyon, who are all three very bright, very talented guys. And we are hoping for a director of the caliber of Steve Spielberg, who did Duel. And uh, it's uh, uh, they're going to spend a lot of money to build the robot. And it's a hell of a script idea, and it looks like it's good, and I'm working on it with Ben Bova, and Ben is dynamite to work with. Thus far, everything is going, everything is just clicking along like crazy. ABC is cooperating, and everybody is, is happy. You came in with a tale of woe and went out and... Are I'd like to ask a question story. about that title, Brillo. Isn't that a copyrighted product name? Yeah, we, we, uh, in fact, they're, they're trying to get the Purex company to let us use the name, and they probably will not, so I'll probably have to change it. God knows what it'll be called. Pole Chicken Stalker 13 or something, who knows what. I got to come up with another title. Anyhow, we call the, we call the robot Brillo because he's a he's a robot cop and that means he's metal fuzz, and that's not my pun. That's Ben Bova and he's stuck with it, baby. <laughs> Thank it, you very much, Harlan, for coming down. Whether or not uh, got a great education in television tonight. Well, it's a hell of an education getting it uh, when you when you when you when you're on the, the business end. Tuition was eighty five G's, huh? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> well, there's always next season. Hey, listen, at least you could say I'm a man of ethic, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll settle for that. You just did. <laughs> this is Mike Hodel for Hour 25. This is KPFK in Los Angeles.